This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. Mitochondria is the key for chronic illness healing. Research has shown that even EMFs, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cell phone towers, these things, will damage our mitochondria. I'm like, Heather, get over here, you know, and she comes over and just like looks at me wide eye, wants to look away, but really intrigued. What is it? I'm like, these are parasites. The underlying reason why we have a modern day parasitic epidemic is because there's a modern day toxicity epidemic. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Season 2 Expert Series, where you'll meet 24 of the world's leaders in health, discussing their passions and what it takes to make a shift. We tend to be our, our harshest critics. We are more than the muscle and bones in our body. Whoa, that's so opposite of what I was taught growing up. I would like to call to arms for women to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. Hi, I'm Catherine Maslin, naturopath, author, and host of The Shift. In the expert series, we share the insight stories and expertise of each of our amazing experts. We're talking doctors, authors, naturopaths, researchers, and thought leaders. You may have heard them on season two of The Shift, where we took snippets of these interviews to put them together in the series for you. If you haven't listened to season two yet, I'd highly recommend checking out episode one, which will give you an overview of what constitutes women's hormonal health and a sneak peek into the series. We'll provide a link in the show notes. Dr. Jay Davidson, also known as The Lime Guy, is a two-time international best-selling author and specialist in foundational medicine. Starting out as a doctor of chiropractic, Dr. Davidson has dedicated his career to understanding complex multi-system diseases after his wife was diagnosed with Lyme disease. He is the co-founder of Cellcore Biosciences and the creator of Microbe Formulas. Dr. Davidson is a speaker, media advocate, and has a wealth of knowledge that we're going to dig into. Let's begin. Dr. J. Thank you so much for being with me today to talk about some really interesting health concepts. But before we get started, can you please just introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what you do? It's great being here too, Catherine. Uh, super excited for this uh, interview. But a trained chiropractor, so went through school with my wife. My wife's a, a trained chiro as well. Came out in the uh, structural correction chiropractic world and changing spines and then when my wife turned 30 on her 30th birthday, she gave birth to my daughter and pretty much the bottom fell out. Lyme disease came raging back. And so our whole focus, my whole focus really shifted from this structural correction, chiropractic and teaching health lifestyle things to how do I save my wife's life? And it was through that, that really shifted everything. And I dove into what's probably referred to as functional medicine, chronic infections, um, you know, that detoxification drainage world. Uh, and that's really what I'm passionate about. What was life like when your wife was going through all of that stuff? Like, what were you guys experiencing? Lots of stress. When I put myself back there, I get, I get tears. I get tears in my eyes because I, I can still remember being in Wisconsin when this happened and laying next to her and not wanting to go to bed because I didn't know when I woke up if she'd be alive or not. Like it was that, you know, I just get choked up thinking about it. So it was, it was, it was at a very dark place and it was pretty much when my, my daughter was two months old. So my wife's body was shutting down. She couldn't breastfeed. So she stopped, she stopped producing milk. So, she, you know, we started making the whole Weston Price goat milk formula and, and all that and along with like, what's going on? What, what's happening in, in the back of my head? It's like, well, she had Lyme disease when she was seven. She was in a coma for six weeks. And that started this chaos of health. Like, is it Lyme? And at the time we ran Pharmacin Labs, I spot Lyme test, no longer available. But at the time we did. And um, according to the testing, it was like over, um, I think over 17 was positive or that was the equivocal. And she was an 88, which basically meant she was in acute phase of Lyme. Like it came raging back basically. 
from the pregnancy. And it's like, wow. I mean, just a slap in the face and, and all this emotion that came into it because she had Lyme when she was seven. Now she's 30 years old at the time when my daughter was born. And she's like, great. You know, this all this emotional stress on top of this of like, can I even be a mom? And I want to get back to the office, but my body's like shutting down. So there's a lot of changes that happen in that. But I will say the gift was in the experience. You know, the gift was in the experience that has really uh, allowed us to figure so much out. Uh, and now she's, you know, you'll see her uh, <laughs> when we're done with this. I mean, she's doing just amazing. It's fantastic. What was the healing journey like? What were the things that you discovered and what was, what was it, I guess, that pushed you in this direction to where you are now? Yeah, we tried a lot of a lot of things. Went to a lot of experts. I'm definitely OCD, so I researched everything, listened to everything. You know, I'm that person that listens to an audio, a YouTube video at 4x speed. You know, my brain just kind of goes there. So I was into that. That's back in 2012. So we did intermittent fasting, uh, and actually kind of forced into it because we were informed to do this cleanse of cultured way, if you will, from a, a person, and she reacted, and she became ultra sensitive to every single food, anything she put in her body, even spinach. I mean, just phlegmed up and her throat would close off. So basically she was forced into water fasting and she also did uh, bone broth, bone like tradition, not the, not the powder, but the traditional bone broth she would drink. And those were the only two things that she wouldn't react to. So she did that for 17 days. She dropped about 40 pounds. She gained about 45, 50 from pregnancy. She dropped about 40 pounds in that time period, which I wouldn't recommend, but her body was just shutting down and it went into this survival. So that opened us up to fasting. Uh, we went into the detoxification side and the heavy metals really helped more than any Lyme treatment. Actually, detoxifying heavy metals was a big piece for her journey. Then we started learning about parasites, started going down that route, then the mitochondria and you know radioactive element toxicity. And it's like, as we continue just to peel the layers back, her health would just go to the next level. You know, it's like we'd hit a wall and it's like, okay, we're missing something. What are we missing? And then that would open up to another another piece. Tell me a bit about the mitochondria. I guess to begin with, what is a mitochondria and what does it do? Yeah, mitochondria, we're taught in cell biology or in school that it's the energy factory of the body, basically makes ATP. So oftentimes you hear experts talk and say, oh, we need to heal at the cellular level, or we need to detox at the cellular level. And I'll say, actually, we need to heal at the mitochondrial level. So we're roughly about 30 trillion human cells. Uh, the, the typical male 170 pounds research shows that we're about 30 trillion human cells and about 39 trillion bacterial cells. So we're pretty close to actually a one-to-one -one ratio. They kind of joke that when you go number two, that you become more human than bacteria, that the ratio changes a little bit. But so if you think, okay, I'm about 30 trillion cells, about 25 trillion are red blood cells, which actually don't have mitochondria. Otherwise, every other cell in our body has mitochondria. So we're about 5 trillion cells of mitochondria inside the cell. Mitochondria, anywhere between hundreds up to usually about 10,000 mitochondria are in a cell. So if I have 30 trillion cells, 5 trillion of those cells have mitochondria that are non-red blood cells, about, let's say, 2,000 on average. That puts us at about 10.2 quadrillion. So there's million, then there's billion, then there's trillion, then there's what this thing's called quadrillion. We're about 10 quadrillion mitochondria. And I, I just want to go through that because when you, when you think about it, you know, it is all about the cell, but inside of the cell, we could have 2,000 or our brain, for instance, per cell has 10,000 mitochondria in it. Even certain parts of the brain, Substantia Niagara, they've shown in research that actually has 2 million mitochondria per cell. So the numbers get pretty vast, but essentially mitochondria generate energy. And that's what we were taught in biology. But now research is showing Dr. Bob or Robert Navio out of Southern California, done incredible work in the last decade. I mean, just even research from, you know, last year, 2019, he's published and is just changing the game on understanding chronic illness and even the mitochondria's role in hormones. So mitochondria basically have two options. They either make energy or they go into what's called battleship mode. Battleship mode, or another name for it would be cell danger response. It means that the mitochondria are critical with immune system activation. 
Amazing. So basically, we have a gazillion of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ten, like ten quadrillion, roughly, based on my calculations. So <laughs> crazy. So, what is the problem with them? What is there? Are there issues surrounding the mitochondria? So essentially, the different things that we're surrounded by. So chemical stressors, mental, emotional stressors, physical stressors. I mean, research has shown that even EMFs, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cell phone towers, these things will damage our mitochondria. So if they're damaging our mitochondria, they're basically lessening the, the ability for our body to function. Low mitochondrial function causes POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia. Uh, low mitochondrial function causes issues of the skin where you don't sweat, like, you, you know, you, you shut down basically that skin pathway. So it's, it's involved with every aspect of the body. But the takeaway is when we're exposed to a toxin, like chemical, like glyphosate, heavy metal, toxic heavy metal, or radioactive element, or we have some type of infection that comes up, bacteria, virus, fungus, you name it, that triggers in the mitochondria what's called cell danger response. And all you got to know is that the ATP that's used inside of the cell for tidying up the cell and metabolism shifts into communication. So it leaves the cell, ATP leaves the cell, the DNA of the mitochondria is used as a signaling. That's why there's no mitochondria in red blood cells. So when you when your body picks up DNA in the bloodstream, it's saying, whoa, hey, there's a problem. There's immune system. And the bigger it is, the more systemic it goes. So mitochondria are the canaries in the coal mine. So when there's an infection, when there's stressors, they go into cell danger response. And there's three phases, cell danger response one, two, and three. Uh, and you have, once you enter into one, you have to go to two, three to then get to recovery. Like there's no just, oh, I'm going to go back a step. Like, no, you have to go forward. And the takeaway from the mitochondria is the mitochondria is really the rate limiting step for hormone production. Like that's kind of the aha when, when you look at research and say, wow, mitochondria is the key for chronic illness healing. Mitochondria is the key to prevent from ever getting sick again, but it's actually the key to restore normal functioning such as the hormones and other things in the body. So obviously there's a lot of things at play here and the traditional model of hormones is you have an ovary, it makes estrogen, right? You have an adrenal, it makes cortisol. How does this thinking change that and how does it fit into the ecosystem of what's going on in the body? When you look at the hormone tree or the steroid tree, basically all hormones come from cholesterol, which is always interesting that we're trying to lower our cholesterol and, you know, this this whole paradigm because it's like, well, if you have hormonal issues, then you definitely don't want to lower your cholesterol because cholesterol is the precursor. So when you look at the, the biochemistry of the hormone production, essentially cholesterol is transported. So the mitochondria has a double membrane, just like our cells have a double membrane. They have like the outer and the inner, the the biphospholipid membrane. Well, the mitochondria has an outer and an inner membrane. So cholesterol is transported from the outer to the inner membrane. And then there's an enzyme that basically cleaves off this side chain and that turns into pregnenolone. That happens in the mitochondria. And research backs all this up to basically say that this is the rate limiting step of hormone production is the cholesterol to pregnenolone. And then from pregnenolone, we'll, you know, eventually get to cortisol or eventually get to progesterone or estrogen or testosterone, right? Like it, it goes down that path, but mitochondria is actually the rate limiting step. Now, certain hormones will actually then, um, like for instance, cortisol in the adrenals, it's actually in the mitochondria where that last conversion to make cortisol happens. So the mitochondria is not only the rate limiting step, but it's also actually involved in that. So where we're taught, In school, like testosterone, right, is made in the Leydig cells of the gonads, for instance. Well, yes, that's true, but there's an interconnection play of the mitochondria by communication that's actually saying whether to make that or not. And the pre-steps, the pregnenolone happens in the mitochondria. So when I look at hormones, I'm looking at, okay, we need to figure out, first of all, why are the mitochondria out of kilter? Like what's the source? And then you know, how do we, how do we give some love to the mitochondria, but then how do we get to the source of the sources that are actually affecting the mitochondria at the underlying level? Cause if we do that, now we actually start the whole hormone chain in the body where then maybe somebody doesn't need hormone replacement forever. You know, maybe they need it as a boost to get them back on, on track. But if we actually get to the underlying cause, then everything changes. So on a really basic level, could we see the mitochondria then as a gatekeeper? 
Limit. Oh, totally. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They're the rate limiting step, basically. That trans that that conversion from cholesterol to pregnenolone happens in the inner mitochondria, and that is the critical step. So this is a very poorly misunderstood concept, right? Uh, particularly in mainstream medicine, where even hormonal production is a poorly understood concept sometimes. <laughs> so what happens then if somebody shows up as hormonally deficient? Let's say they have a blood test, they have low testosterone, and their doctor's like, well, let's just give you testosterone. What is the implication of that when it's the mitochondria that's the problem and not the actual production? Well, I mean, my take right away from that is you're band-aiding the situation and you're not actually getting to the source. Now, there's times when when the hormones are so low, I mean, males, females just feel like crud and they can't even function and giving some hormones changes lives. Like clearly that's that. But if we don't get to the source, I am always like, then you're going to be stuck on this stuff forever. In the literature, it's it's kind of up in the air right now on testosterone's role in the mitochondria. There's literature that basically says that when you get your testosterone levels to optimal levels, that actually benefits the mitochondria. But then there's some research that says, well, it actually is a stressor to the mitochondria. And my my interpretation, at least on you know understanding this, is it's not too talked about to have a lot of discussions on, is I think appropriate levels definitely benefit the mitochondria. Inappropriate levels probably damage it, right? There's that harmony balance in the body. So this is looking at it from a homeostasis point of view. The body's always going to try and be balanced. Too low is not good, too high is not good. So we have these little things, the mitochondria inside of our cells, thousands of them. What are the things that we need to look out for that are actually causing the dysfunction? So you mentioned some of them earlier, but let's go into a bit more of that. Yeah. So chronic infections, I mean, you can boil the topic's down into toxins and infection generally, probably the number one infection is going to be parasites. So chronic parasitic infections, which is a real, one of the main causes of autoimmunity right now. And so many diseases are getting thrown in the autoimmune category, even autism. And, you know, even talking about type two diabetes, which we always thought was just blood sugars, you know, they're saying, well, there's autoimmune components to that too. Chronic parasitic infections. Parasites are interesting where they actually, they'll steal your nutrients from you. You know, the the Greek meaning of parasite is one that sits at another's table. You're like, okay, well, stop sitting at my table. Like, you know, get out of here. And and most people are going to say, well, I don't have parasites. I live in a first world country. I'm in America. I'm in Australia. I'm in, you know, name the country that's first world. But um, parasites don't know borders. And yes, are they more prevalent in third world countries? Yeah, because untreated water. But parasites are found in all countries. They're found in soil, walking barefoot. You can get hookworms that stick right in in and go in. If somebody sneezes, you can actually sneeze out pinworm eggs. So you're not just covering your mouth for bacteria or viruses. It's also pinworms. Drinking water, uh, food, whether you are plant-based or carnivore or anything in between, there's parasites in meats and there's parasites in vegetables. Uh, You know, it's really actually prevalent in salad bars because of the mishandling of food, you know, and multiple people touching it. So parasites are all over the place. So once we understand that, then it's like, okay, well, what am I doing to parasite cleanse? So parasites are a big one. In the literature, though, it actually has shown that parasites will steal your ATP energy that the mitochondria is making for itself. Right. And then uh, obviously it's causing a blockage, right, in the system. Yeah, well, yeah, lack of ATP, basically, then you can't use it as communication, you can't use it as energy. So oftentimes, chronic fatigue sets in, right? Like in the in the chronic Lyme world that I've worked in so so many years and parasites and detoxing, one of the first things that shuts down is sex hormones. It's like, boom, libido gone. Why is that? Because the mitochondria is shifting from this happy power plant mode, homeostasis, taking care of everything to sh- uh, shifting into battleship mode. And the battleship mode is because of infection like that. Uh, viruses will damage the mitochondria, like, you know, shut down. It'll uh, Certain viruses like herpes simplex type 1 will actually shut down the intake of calcium into the cell for the mitochondria and then damage the function of that. So we have viruses, we have parasites, fungus, mycotoxins, which is essentially a toxin that mold gives off, very damaging to mitochondria. Uh, along with bacteria like Lyme disease and, you know, other infections. What are some of the common parasites that you've seen in people? Uh, well, I I had Ascaris lumbricoides. It's a roundworm among other critters. So I, I have a good friend, uh, co-founder now, Microbe Formulas and Cellcore Biosciences, our company. But 
uh, Todd Watts at the time, I was speaking on stage. I was talking about Lyme and hormones, actually. And this guy raises his hand at the end and starts asking questions. I'm like, wow, this guy is either a jerk or he's really smart and just wants to know the answer. He came up to me after we were talking. And it turns out he's huge heart, just really smart, understands biochemistry and looking for looking for answers. And so we went out to dinner with some mutual friends and he showed me pictures on his phone. And I'm like, what are, what, what are those? He's like, oh, that's, you know, this worm or that's that. And I mean, basically critters that were coming out of people, like holding up against the toilet, right? S- pictures in the stool. I'm like, man, I want to do that. Like, that sounds, that sounds awesome. I've never seen that stuff. So he sends me a bottle of mimosa pudica seed. I'm like, mimosa pudica seed, okay? And it comes in this pharmaceutical looking bottle. I'm like, dude, is this, a, is this a medication? And he said, no, it's so sticky. I have it hand encapsulated at a compound pharmacist. You know, it's just got a sticker. that says Mimosa Pudica on the front. I'm like, okay. So I start taking it. Within uh, 16 days, my stomach's rolling. I saw this like four or five inch looking worm thing in my stool. I'm like, whoa, it's working. 16, 17 days in, I'm at a seminar. I'm not speaking, just attending. And all of a sudden, my stomach feels nauseous. Like, oh, I'm, am I nervous? Like, what's going on? I had some loose stools that day. The next day, I go to the bathroom. Like, whoa, just that parasympathetic rush through you. Like, I feel so much better. You know, like that, I just broke a sweat, but now I'm like so much better. I go to wipe. I'm like, that didn't feel right. I look down and there's these two worms hanging out of me into the toilet bowl. They were dead. But they're hanging from me in the toilet bowl and I yell. My wife and daughter happened to be in the hotel room. My brother-in-law was too. And I yell, I'm like, Heather, get over here. My daughter comes over at the time. She's only three. You know, she's seven and a half as we're recording this now. So this is quite a few years ago. She runs over. She looks at me, looks down, looks at me. She's like, dad, why do you have string hanging from your butt? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Heather, get over here. You know, and she comes over and just like looks at me wide eye, wants to look away, but really intrigued. What is it? I'm like, these are parasites. And my mind starts thinking, I'm like, wait a minute, if I have these, a relatively healthy guy, who else does? So just to finish this, this story to, to close this chapter here, I take some toilet paper, grab onto him, just slowly pull him out, you know, clean up. And, I'm, and my mind's just racing. I'm like, wait a minute, I had parasites. For the next month and a half, I had like four to six inch worms, just piles in the stool. It didn't even look like I was, I had normal stool. It looked, you know, like parasites just coming out. And all of a sudden it stopped. I'm like, Phew, I'm done. And I stopped. And then I started getting some GI symptoms. I went back on it a month later, piles of worms again. It stopped after a month, month and a half. I stopped. I'm like, I must be done again. And then all of a sudden started getting symptoms. I went back on. I'm like, okay, this is, this is a great experience to understand that first of all, parasites affect everyone. If you have, you know, if you live in this world, if you drink water, eat food, have pets, I mean, all of these are basically making you susceptible to them, but you got to be persistent and consistent to get it out. You know, that the, the overnight one dose medication or the weekend, you know, herbal blast isn't enough to really, to really clear that out. But parasites I found to be such a big issue. And the underlying reason why we have a modern day parasitic epidemic is because there's a modern day toxicity epidemic. The toxins are creating an environment to attract parasites. Certain toxins like heavy metals, for instance, the parasites actually absorb, they act like sponges. So they help, they help with some of the burden, but then you get all the downside of what parasites cause, and you still technically have the heavy metals in your body because the parasites are in there. And then that starts this whole cascade. So as I look at just where we're at with health, got to consider infection and parasites being the number one because, um, you know, Dr. Klinghart talks about how mold spores live inside of parasites. Heavy metals uh, we know are stored within parasites. Certain infection, like uh, Dr. Alan McDonald, researcher, found that Lyme disease lives safely within nematodes, which is a type of parasite. We know virus, certain viruses live inside of parasites and then the whole shifting the immune system. So I look at parasites as being kind of that first domino to knock down that opens you up to all this other stuff. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm sure that people who have listened to season one of The Shift, which is all around gut health and poo and all of that stuff are kind of okay, but it's really confronting for a lot of people to hear a story like that, you know, and even to understand that we have stuff living in, on and around us. So do you think then, 
you know, let's say pre-toxins, chemicals, processed food, you know, when we were hunter-gatherers, that parasites were a natural part of our ecosystem rather than a problem back then? Yes, parasites have always been there. Parasites have actually been shown to be the most resistant creatures around. So they've they found parasites that were 30 plus thousand years old and 40 plus thousand years old in their estimate that were frozen. They thaw them and they come back to life. Like they're very, you know, they're very, they seem really simple and like, oh, this wouldn't be an issue, but they're very resistant. I believe it's a bigger epidemic now though, because of the toxicity epidemic. I just don't think we had the same type of issues before because we weren't having the same environments in our body as we do now. The, essentially, the more toxins we're surrounded by, the more uh, chemicals, the more we were attracting parasites and these type of critters inside of our body. So I would imagine it was less of a factor before, but then there was also issues with hygiene, you know? I mean, if you made it past birth, then you had a pretty good life expectancy, you know, um, mainly because of the hygiene. So it's a great question to ask, but I do think the epidemic is greater now because of the toxicity epidemic. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people all over the world to shift their health and their lives. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why things are happening, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is an individual, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Clinic. Tell me about toxicity in our modern world. What are, what are you seeing? Glyphosate being a really big one. There's so much cutting edge research we're figuring out in the glyphosate. So in our collagen, in our joints, what we're seeing nowadays, like with athletes, is people are blowing ACLs out, shoulders, all this stuff. Versus 30 years ago, a high school football team, no injuries or maybe one injury. Now half the team by the time the season's over is like they're injured and they're out and they're having surgery. It's like, what what changed? Toxins like glyphosate has been a big reason for it. So glyphosate actually replaces the glycine molecule on collagen, disrupts co copper and how it intertwines. So it makes our joints a lot less able to handle abruptness. Glyphosate, though, is a, you know, it's an antibiotic. It sterilizes our gut, causes leaky gut, causes a lot of type of issues. So I'd say that's probably top of the list just with the exposure nowadays. And there's so many more things than just hormones or gut, but really like joints and things. Plastics is a big one in the hormones, you know, xenoestrogens and things, phthalates that mimic uh, hormones. Heavy metals, toxic heavy metals have been talked about a lot. I would say the number one toxin that is not discussed enough is radioactive elements. And sometimes people say radiation, but I, I hesitate on saying radiation because it's easy to think, oh, that's Wi-Fi, that's Bluetooth, that's like the EMF radiation because that's the non-ionizing form of radiation, but the ionizing form of radiation is radioactive elements like cesium, radium, uranium, thorium, these chemicals that are found in our water supply that are very much more damaging than heavy metals are and just wreak havoc on our mitochondria, wreak havoc on our hormones in our body. Like for instance, the Environmental Working Group did research and they surveyed the water wells in America and the water treatment plants, if you will. And they found that 170 million Americans, so half the population, had toxic levels of radium in the water supply. The state of Texas, 80% of them had toxic levels of radium in the water supply. Texas is a huge state in America. And how many labs are actually able to test radium right now? Very few. But radium essentially is a bone seeker, so it likes calcium. So where people talk about osteoporosis and lead, where lead likes calcium and compete in the bone, it's really radium that is a very strong competition for calcium, kicks that out. But a radioactive element actually gives off damaging energy consistently. So imagine standing next to a, a campfire. You're like, oh, that feels good, you know, nice and, nice and warm. Now take a coal that's in that hot fire and swallow it. That's essentially what radioactive elements are, that they're going to continually emit energy that's going to damage our DNA, that's going to damage the mitochondria. And as soon as you damage the mitochondria, you're shutting off the whole hormone sequence from the get-go. But it's also suppressing the immune system. So people that are getting Lyme disease, like in, in America, there's an area 
in the Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, you know, where there's a lot of Lyme disease, if you will, it's a certain bacteria infection. And there's an area in Wisconsin that's called the radium belt, where it has very high amounts of radium in it. And it's like, huh, I wonder why so many people are getting Lyme disease in certain areas. Could it be actually the underlying radioactive elements that they're drinking or exposed to that then is lowering the immune system so any bug they're around, they catch and then it, you know, turns into a cascade. So much of it really comes from the underlying toxicity and infection side that until we get to that, I just feel like you're just stuck on hormones until you find the source. So radium, what do we know from research and is it able to be excreted from the human body? Uh, yeah, there's, there's great research showing fulvic acid at low pHs. It is good at binding on to certain types of radioactive elements. Uh, uranyl nitrites and radium and things like that. The interesting thing on research though for radium is very few labs of any kind are testing for radium. It's more governmental. So it's like, you know, not really available necessarily to the public. But in some literature, it showed that 98% of the radium that's excreted comes out the feces. So it's almost like if we were to do, and we're working on this in our lab, trying to figure out the best way to actually run some testing, urine, blood, feces, like, yep, I think you have to test multiple things, but there's got to be a stool test that's going to need to be created in order to accurately test a radium, but it can absolutely come out. It is strong though. So it, it, it's going to be there until you work on excreting it for sure. So if somebody's suffering from constipation, you know, even mild constipation, then that's going to lead to obviously higher levels of a lot of things, but particularly radium. If yeah. that's the main exc excretion rune. Yeah, yeah. Really your drainage pathway, like just going number two is drainage, right? Your kidneys excreting urine, sweating, your liver bile duct. You know, there's all kinds of drainage pathways, if you will, in your body or what I refer to. I know a lot of people just refer to it as detox, but if the colon is backed up, everything backs up in the body. I mean, if you're not pooping, like first of all, people get cranky <laughs> if they're not going, um, let alone the fact that, yeah, all the toxins stay within the body and you get more exposed. So the first step with general health is uh, definitely taking care of your mitochondria and then opening up the drainage pathways. I think that's really the, that first primary step. And then you start reaching into parasite cleansing, detoxification, like actual chemicals, you know, pulling them out, and then maybe more of the smaller chronic infections. So drainage is basically detoxification through bowel, kidneys, skin. I love to differentiate the word drainage versus detox. Detox is used kind of for everything. I mean, it could be a seven-day juice cleanse. It could be like just taking some pooping pills. It could be IV chelation, you know, like, I mean, it's used a lot. So I like to differentiate detox personally in conversations of just saying, hey, this is actually grabbing onto chemicals, pulling them out. Drainage is just the normal pathways that need to move things. So the colon, the liver bile duct, which I would argue is probably the number one thing. Uh, and when you are estrogen dominant, it clogs up the bile flow and the drainage of the liver bile duct exponentially, which then hinders detoxification and all kinds of problems. But you've got the colon, you've got the kidneys, you've got the liver, you've got the lymphatic system, which is actually two times as much fluid than the cardiovascular system. You've got the brain connection to the lymphatic, which is called the glymphatic system. Uh, so if somebody that s suffers from brain fog, memory issues, you know, just poor cognitive function, they're going to, they're going to need brain drainage. But in order to drain the brain, the glymphatic, the colon has to be moving is the base of the funnel. The next level up is the liver bile duct because the lymphatic system really connects into that. The lymphatic and then the brain drainage. So there's there's a priority for drainage, but essentially, yeah, lymph, the glymphatics, the liver bile duct, the kidneys, sweating. My wife didn't sweat for years and we thought, oh, what a blessing. You don't even need deodorant. And then when the crash happened, it was like, wow, there were so many signs that should have gave us clues like, hey, we need to work on what's going on. But you know, unfortunately we needed, well, fortunately we needed that crisis to then open up and be like, okay, what's going on? Can I ask a huge favor? If you like this podcast, the very best thing that you can do to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify. This will help to push us up in the charts, which gets us into the ears of more people just like you that are also trying to make their shift. Tell me about the biggest shift that you've made in your life up to now. There's been a lot. 
One of them is taking care of myself. Uh, very much, uh, my mom was a workaholic. I'm in that category and I very much still work way too much and research too much. But this is something that I see is so beneficial for listener to is self-care. It's so easy to be this kind of type A, what am I going to get done? You know, what can I put on my to-do list and how can I accomplish that and feel good and push, push, push and take care of everybody else that are friends and family of mine. And, the, and then just, you, you kind of go on the back burner. That is just a recipe waiting to collapse, waiting to get crushed, waiting for your hormones to be jacked up, waiting for you to literally have no energy where you can't get out of bed. So I feel like the last, at least personally, the last two years, I've been working more on my own self and definitely my own, you know, spiritual journey. And I feel as if the more I work on myself, the easier answers, information, protocols comes in where you would think it's like, oh no, the more you research, the more you spend on protocols, which I spend a lot of time on that too. But it's interesting how sometimes just taking time for yourself can be one of the greatest things. So it's looking at knowing versus knowing. So there's knowing the information and doing the research, but then there's that inner knowing that we can only really access once we initiate that self-care and create space for ourselves. And I mean, by the sounds of it, your wife has made a miraculous recovery, you know, or you could call it miraculous, or you guys just methodically did the right thing for her body to heal, <laughs> whichever way you want to look at it. So it's been a really rocky road for you guys. So what would you say your philosophy is around health? Health is priority for sure. Most people will say health is the priority, but then when you actually look at the actions of what individuals take, I'm like, is really health the priority? Because it's easy to say, oh, you know, God's number one, uh, my family's two, health is three, right? As far as like, what's my priorities? What are my goals in life? But you get, you get down to the nitty gritty when you look at, well, where are you actually spending your time? Clearly somebody is listening to this series they have health as a priority because they're investing energy to gather up this valuable information you're putting together as you travel around the globe, which is so awesome. I just, I'm amazed that you do that. So cool. But yeah, I mean, health has got to be number one. We had health as a, as a high priority just because of, I had health issues growing up. Uh, my wife clearly had a lot of stuff. And so there was a priority to it, but it went to a whole new level and she nearly died. It's like, okay, this is where we're you know, investing time and energy. This is, you know, what we're going to focus on. But there's a really fine line, Catherine, of also obsessing about it to the point that now you're actually causing damage. It's like, whoa, 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 what do you mean I'm obsessing? Yeah, like all your work, all you're thinking about is, well, you know, now I'm in this Uber and there's this uh, air freshener and I'm, you know, I can't even breathe and now I'm getting a headache and now that just set me back two months of healing. You know, like you, you can get into this phase where it's like, okay, back up, hold the train. Our bodies were designed to handle stress. When we're in a sick and chronic illness, our bucket, our energy bucket, yeah, there's not a lot of give there. Like, you know, when you push it too much, boom, you crash. As you get healthy, we start building up this reserve that when we're exposed to stress, whether it's mental, emotional stress, which is usually the number one thing that takes people out, or physical stress, uh, chemical stress, like living in a moldy building or, you know, riding a, an Uber and you get exposed to the, you know, toxins or you're in a hotel that stinks, that kind of thing. Like your body's designed to fight that. So where I do see certain individuals go is they go over the top, excessive, where Everything is like, well, what what ingredients, what's in that food? Like, what, what about that? Oh, I can't have that. I can't eat that. It's like, wait a minute, back up. I, and, and we're at my house right now, you know, I have no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no wireless because I know it's less stress in the body. However, if I go to a hotel or I go to a friend's house, I don't ask him to turn the Wi-Fi off. I just know my body's, my body can handle a little extra stress on it. But when we get to this excessive point where everything is, well, it's got to be perfectly lined up. Otherwise you crash. That's, you're in a wrong mental space. And also that tells me from a clinical side, you're not actually getting to the source or sources of what's holding some, what's actually holding you back. And you're having to bandaid or kind of, you know, minimize as much toxicity as possible. Otherwise you're just, you know, over the top, you fall off the, the cliff, you crash and it, it spirals. I love everything you just said. And it's a conversation that we have a lot at shift, which is how do people make their shifts, but what stops them from shifting and what keeps them stuck? So what do you think the biggest roadblock to healing is for people? One of them is 
identity. This identity that, let's say, you know, you were diagnosed with, oh, I have hormonal issues. You know, oh, it's my thyroid. Oh, I have adrenal fatigue. Well, you start giving yourself these definitions and you start saying, I am adrenal fatigue, right? I have it. I am it. So then you start identifying with it. And if you were to get rid of the quote unquote adrenal fatigue, which could be a whole nother discussion. And I would say it's mitochondrial dysfunction. But if you were to quote unquote, get rid of those symptoms, could you even envision what your identity would be without that? And if you can't, how are you ever going to get well? Because you're always going to come back and retreat to your identity. I think about my, my grandfather, he's passed on now about 10 years ago, but he smoked a pipe. And everybody's like, you got to get rid of it. You know, you can't smoke your pipe around the kids. And, you know, everybody's like, people don't like it. And he just kept going back to it, kept going back to it. And I started thinking, I'm like, that's his identity. He's known as like the crazy inventor with the pipe. Like that, that was like his identity. So if your identity is wrapped up in a certain way that you feel, or your identity is wrapped up in a certain disease, like, oh, I have Lyme disease. Okay, well, by you saying you have Lyme disease, you are Lyme disease. But what if you said, I have Lyme disease symptoms? Now that says that you're not Lyme disease, there's a very big distinction, right? Like, oh, I have hormonal problems. Okay, well, that's your identity because you're saying that. But what if you just said, I have a lot of hormonal symptoms right now, but that's not who I am. So I, I believe, Catherine, that our identity is one of those big things that holds people back. Now, clearly there's bad protocols, there's products that don't work. There's uh, the order that you approach it in, like all that matters in your mindset. But the identity piece is probably the cherry on top of like, well, am I going to get the same attention if I'm well versus if I'm sick? I mean, these are real questions to ask. Like, there's no way I'm thinking that. Like, well, really, are you okay with being well? And maybe your relationships will be different. Or did you not get attention as a kid and you got attention by, oh, my tummy hurts. Oh, my head hurts, right? And now there's this unconscious thing that's ingrained of like, well, when I don't feel good, I get attention. And it's nothing personal as much as let's just open up the kimono and see and let's clear all that out because you are who you need to be when you're in optimum health. You're not who you need to be when you're in this state that you've created based on you know symptoms that you're having. I completely resonate with everything you just said, Jay. And it's, I think for a lot of people, this, these kind of conversations would push them. It would push their edges. And if that's the case, it's because you need to hear it. <laughs> and one of the questions that we ask our patients at Shift is, what is the worst thing about you getting better? You know, and really mulling on that question, you know, what is the worst thing about you getting better? And it's really interesting because people sit there and they're like, oh, Oh, actually, you know, there's maybe some stuff behind that. One last question for you. If you could give just one piece of advice to someone who is wanting to make a shift in their health, what would it be? One piece of advice. It's in the perfection category. So if you're somebody that does not take a lot of action because you're waiting for things to be perfect, there's two pieces that are great to understand about this. First of all, what is the only direction you can move once you perfect something or once you achieve perfection, right? Like we were taught typically as kids, like, oh, that's what we need to achieve, like perfection. But life is, the, the gift is in the experience of life, not in the perfection of anything. Because once you perfect life or you perfect something, the only direction you can go is down. So I would say we don't want to, we don't want to achieve perfection, first of all. But even if our goal was to achieve perfection, we get closer to that goal by just taking action today. So it's easy to just consume information like, like, you know, this amazing, uh, season two series that you're doing, Catherine, and just, I mean, the amount of time and effort and travel you're doing, I, I the listener, you know, probably doesn't comprehend it, but it, I mean, you're doing so much, you know, for this person that's listening. But the idea is I'm going to listen. Oh, I'm just going to keep taking information. It's like, well, what, what can you take action on today? Like what's one thing that you can move on today? And if you're paralyzed and say, well, I just, I don't think I'm ready yet. I don't think I understand this topic enough. Like sell danger response. Like I don't even, I don't even know about that. Great. Well, you don't have to know everything. 
a lot of doctors, if you will, they call it practice. Like, hey, I have a practice because they're practicing. They're still figuring things out, right? Like we're still, we still don't have all the answers and that's okay. So if you are paralyzed by perfection, first of all, don't strive for it. Second of all, if you actually wanted to quote unquote perfect something, you do that by just taking action, by just going out and doing it. And the more that you do it, the more you realize and learn stuff and figure it out uh, and typically learn faster that way than if you just kind of sit in the shadows and, you know, uh, stay isolated and just try to take information. It's like, no, we are relational beings and we need to experience life. And if we look at it from that standpoint, we stop isolating ourselves and stop being like, well, I got to make sure everything's perfect. It's like, no, no, no. Experience life. You're right where you need to be. The gift is in this experience that you're going through. You know, you're only listening to this probably because of your own health issues that you've had, which is a, a gift or family issue, you know, family member health issues. And now you're equipping yourself to be better equipped for life later on. Dr. Jay Davidson, thank you so much for joining us on The Shift and your amazing expertise. Thank you, Catherine. There was so much amazing information in this episode, but some of it was pretty technical. I'll break down the key points and what action you can take as a result of this. Your mitochondria are known as the energy-producing parts of your cells, but they're also important for the conversion of hormones. This is something that is usually missed when it comes to hormonal imbalances. If your mitochondria aren't healthy, then your hormones can't be either. ATP provides the energy needed for many important processes and for signaling between cells. So the conversation around parasites and infections is interesting, as Dr. J mentions that these can essentially steal your ATP, leading to fatigue and mitochondrial dysfunction, which then impacts energy, but also hormonal conversion. We need to think about the role of toxins and how they are specifically impacting our health. Glyphosate was talked about. This is the chemical found in Roundup and is found in our food supply, especially wheat, corn and soy, and even oats and chickpeas. I knew from my research that glyphosate can damage the gut microbiome, but that it can interfere with collagen in the body and lead to joint injuries was news to me. I guess the message here is to be aware that any specific chemical can have a wide range of specific health detriments in the body, so we need to try and keep it clean. Learning is great, but action is better. Here are a few things that you could do as a result of this conversation in order to help you shift your health and your life. The first one is, if you have a chronic disease, you may want to go and get yourself tested for parasites. A stool test through your doctor will do some rudimentary testing. However, the comprehensive stool analysis that a lot of naturopaths and functional practitioners use test for a much wider range of parasites and pathogens. This is what we use for our patients at the Shift Clinic. I don't think it's the best idea to go out and do a full-on parasite cleanse without the right knowledge and support. This is because many of the herbs that kill parasites can also damage your gut microbiome and cause other issues if they aren't used correctly. So please don't listen, then jump on Google and look for a parasite cleanse kit. Find someone like Dr. Davison or our team at the Shift Clinic that can help. Focus on the basics of getting your organs of elimination to work properly. This means having enough water, fibre and nutrients for them to do what they need to do. When we don't drink enough, our kidneys and bowels can't get rid of these toxins like they're meant to. The fibre is essential to bind to toxins and carry them out of your body. Most people are not drinking enough water or having enough fibre in their diet, so make sure that you get these essentials covered. The last one is really easy to do, and that is to turn off your modem while you sleep and put your phone on flight mode. While we're exposed to Wi-Fi every single day and it seems so normal, there is actually evidence that it changes our physiology, so why not avoid it during those eight hours at night when you can? I think this is why getting away to places with no Wi-Fi and no phone reception is such a good idea for us from time to time. It's the only way to unplug 100%. Thank you so much, Dr. Davidson, for sharing your knowledge with us on The Shift. If you liked this episode, please let us know by sharing on social media and tagging Dr. J. Davidson and myself, Catherine Maslin, or The Shift Clinic so that we can hear what you have to say. You can find out more about Dr. J. Davidson at drjdavidson.com or follow him on Instagram at drjdavidson. I'd love to ask you a huge favour. 
Spotify have recently allowed you to comment on an episode. So if you're listening over there, please let me know what you thought of this episode. And as always, your Apple podcast reviews are always welcome. I really enjoy reading them. In our next expert series on The Shift, we have Dr. Felice Gersh, an integrative OBYGYN that is one of my absolute favourites when it comes to women's health. This episode has so much goodness that you won't want to miss it. Coming up on The Shift. I've seen the evolution of malfunction of the female body. We want to be proactive and educate women that they have to think about all of these systems from an early age because you're building your future. When people fast through breakfast, they're harming themselves. The body was evolved to receive food in the morning. I think the biggest threat is our modern society that's putting too much on women. And you just have to learn how to say no and then have to say yes to yourself and your personal needs. This series is a production of The Shift Clinic, hosted by Katherine Maslin. Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequality. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how we will get it done. The Global Goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. The Global Goals are a framework that collectively help us support the health of our people and the planet. At SHIFT, we are ambassadors for the Global Goals. This project supports Global Goal number six. Clean water and sanitation. Every time you listen to an episode of The SHIFT, we provide a day's access to clean water for a human in need in Malawi, Africa. Water Water is the the foundation to health, and and we we believe every human should have access to clean, healthy water. So please share this podcast wide and and keep keep tuning in in so we can impact those who need it the most.